Ever wonder what your tax dollars actually buy when it comes to, say, a billion dollar fighter jet? Well, get ready to dive into the deep end of the US military budget. We're talking about a subject that's often, you know, shrouded in jargon and mystery, right? But it directly impacts every taxpayer, so. Exactly. And by the end of this deep dive, you'll not only grasp the sheer scale of U.S. military spending, but also the why behind those eye-popping numbers and uh, the web of players involved. Yeah. It's complex. Believe me, the scale alone is mind-blowing. It's like, imagine the next 10 largest militaries in the world, all combined. And the U.S. still outspends them. It's a powerful way to drive home the point about U.S. military dominance globally. Totally. But dominance comes at a cost, obviously. And understanding that cost is where our deep dive really begins. Okay, so let's unpack this massive budget, shall we? We've got categories like operations, personnel, research and development. All the things you'd kind of expect, right? Yeah, right. But then it gets interesting. Did you know, for example, that even cleaning up environmental messes we're talking about, those left by military bases, even that falls under the umbrella of defense spending. Really? I mean, it makes sense, but... Wow! It highlights how far-reaching this budget is. And it's not just environmental cleanup. Securing big events like the Olympics also falls under defense. Ah, you learn something new every day. You do. But while those are important, the biggest chunk of the pie, a whopping $352 billion, goes towards this thing called operations and maintenance. Operations and maintenance? Sounds kind of bland for the biggest expense. What's actually included in that? Well, for starters, picture this. Keeping over 1,200 military bases up and running. Wait, 1,200? Seriously? 1,200. Each one, essentially a mini city. We're talking housing, healthcare, power grids, you name it. Wow. And then, of course, you've got salaries for over 1.3 million active duty personnel, training exercises, equipment upkeeping. It all adds up quickly. So over 1,200 bases globally. That really paints a picture of the U.S. military's reach, doesn't it? It does. It's like being the world's landlord, but also it's hall monitor all at once. And that global footprint, maintaining it, especially those overseas bases, comes at a significant cost. They're often designed to be like little slices of America. Really? Oh, familiar fast food chains, American-style grocery stores, you name it. It's all about maintaining morale. I guess that makes sense. But still, it makes you wonder if those billions could be spent in other ways that maybe bolster global security, but differently. It's a valid question. Yeah. But for now, we've got to address the, shall we say, the elephant in the room, private defense contractors. Ah, yes. The private sector's role in all of this. This is where things get really interesting, right? Absolutely. We're talking about companies like Boeing, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, names synonymous with some of the most advanced and expensive military hardware out there. And these companies aren't just like passively waiting for government contracts, are they? They're actively vying for their slice of the pie, which is where the whole revolving door concept comes into play. It's a crucial and often overlooked aspect of what we call the military industrial complex. No. Picture this, a high ranking general retires from the Pentagon on Friday. Okay. Only to reappear on Monday as a high paid consultant or executive at one of these same defense giants that you used to negotiate with. Oh, wow. Talk about a career change. Yeah. But yeah, it definitely raises questions about potential conflicts of interest. Sure. It does make you wonder, did that general, you know, maybe prioritize certain contracts or spending decisions, ones that would benefit their future employer, of course. It's a question that's sparked countless debates and investigations even. And it gets even more complicated, really, when you bring campaign contributions and lobbying efforts into the mix. So these defense contractors are essentially playing both sides of the field here. In a way, yes. They're supplying the, the equipment and then using their influence to, well, make sure the money keeps flowing. It's a powerful position to be in. It is. And the video does a, a really good job, I think, of illustrating this whole dynamic with the example of the F-35 fighter jet program. Oh yeah, the F-35. That's the one that's supposed to be like, what, the Swiss Army knife of fighter jets or something? That's the general idea, yes. Yes. Capable of everything. Although, I'm not sure about the cappuccino making function just yet. Right, right. But here's the thing. Despite, you know, a, a pretty troubled history, we're talking cost overruns, delays, and a price tag that's ballooned to over $1.7 trillion right. over its lifetime, that is. The F-35 program still receives massive funding. 
Why, though? I mean, at that point, wouldn't it be cheaper to just, like, buy every senator a solid gold jetpack? Well, the video points to this fascinating web of influence, really. Lockheed Martin, the primary contractor for the F-35. Okay. They've been very strategic, you see, spreading out their production facilities across hundreds of congressional districts. Like, we're talking 45 states here. So it's not just fighter jets they're building, it's, it's jobs. Exactly. And jobs, well, they come with political weight. Lawmakers, even those who might have doubts about the F-35, its cost, its effectiveness, they're hesitant to cut funding for something that's providing jobs in their district. It's a tough spot to be in. It's like a political hostage situation. But instead of people, it's jobs. Economic prosperity, even. A fitting analogy. And then, of course, you've got the direct lobbying efforts on top of that. Millions of dollars spent every year courting lawmakers, funding think tanks, yeah. you know, shaping public perception. So it's not just about the hardware, it's the whole narrative around it too. Precisely. Creating a narrative of necessity, of technological superiority, bolstering national security. But surely there are other sides to this, right? Not everyone's buying into the idea that just like more military spending automatically equals a safer world. You're absolutely right. The video does address that, touching on the whole peace through strength argument, that a strong military deters aggression. And it's true. Historically speaking, military might has played a role in maintaining peace, although it's often messy and ethically complex, of course. It kind of feels like a chicken and egg situation though, right? Does military strength deter aggression, or does it just lead to, like, an arms race, everyone trying to keep up with the Joneses, or, well, I guess in this case, the U.S. military? The million-dollar question. Yeah. And one that historians, political scientists, continue to debate, really. The video actually uses the Cold War arms race as an example. The U.S. versus the Soviet Union. Right. Which, yeah, didn't lead to direct conflict, luckily. Right. But it definitely created a lot of anxiety. And wasted resources, probably. Not to mention enough nuclear weapons to destroy the planet, like, a dozen times over. Exactly. And that brings us to a, a crucial point, I think. Military spending, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's part of this whole web of things. Geopolitical realities, economic interests, domestic priorities. So, where does that leave us, then? I mean, if we accept that the U.S. military budget is this, this massive, complex thing, shaped by all these different factors, what are we supposed to do with that information? And that is the question the video leaves us with. Yeah. What are the alternatives? What if some of those billions, even a fraction, were redirected to diplomacy, for example? Yeah, yeah. Or development aid, maybe even addressing the root causes of conflict, like poverty and inequality. It's something to think about. I mean, it's compelling thought, but let's for a second play devil's advocate here. Okay. Some folks might say, look, you need a strong military, right? right? To yeah. even make those other approaches, the diplomacy, the A, to make them work. Right, right. That without, you know, that credible threat of force, the other stuff, it's kind of toothless. That's a valid point. It circles back to that classic debate, hard power versus soft power. Right. But the key, I think, is balance. Mm -hmm. Just like relying too much on military might can be, you know, destabilizing, even counterproductive. Yeah. Neglecting those diplomatic tools, the developmental ones, that undermines our long-term security too. It's like that saying, right? If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Exactly. If we only see the world through this military lens. Your solutions are going to be military ones. Makes sense. And I guess that's why these conversations, these deep dives into, you know, these complex topics like the military budget, they're so important. Absolutely. It's about understanding all the different angles, oh, yeah. right? challenging what we think we know, seeing if there are other ways to, well, create a more secure world for everyone. Couldn't say it better myself. Hmm. It boils down to recognizing that our security, it's all interconnected. Helping others, investing in their well-being, that ultimately makes us safer in the long run too. So as we wrap up this deep dive, I think the big takeaway is this conversation doesn't stop here, right? And of course not. This is just the beginning. It's got to be an ongoing thing, you know? Yeah. Exploring, questioning, talking about how we create a better, safer, and more just world for everyone. Well said. And hey, while you're thinking about it, if you had to choose just one area to maybe redirect even a small part of that massive military budget, what would it be? Hmm. Good question. Share your thoughts with us online. Use hashtag deep dive challenge so we can find you. Until next time, stay curious.